All right, so welcome to the third and final installment of the South Korea 2016 sabbatical log. Um, and in addition to the thanks that I want to reiterate for uh, the Korea Society, the Academy of Korean Studies, and the Modesto Junior College Foundation, I'd also like to uh, thank the Yosemite Community College District. Um, I had originally planned to be part of uh, the fellowship in the fall, and uh, YCCD um, had granted me sabbatical to pursue that, as well as a couple of other things. Um, but the the portion that I wanted to take part in uh, of the fellowship in Korea was uh, postponed until the spring. Um, nevertheless, I really appreciate the support from the district, uh, from the college, from the department and the division that I work in for uh, people making the sort of room and, and, and time for me to be able to pursue um, Korean art and culture. All right, so in this third uh, and, and final installment, we'll take the high-speed train from Seoul down to Busan, and on the first day, take a quick trip back to Daegu and then back to Busan, and on the uh, second day, uh, change to car and then head to Gyeongju um, and back, and on the third day, take a really long car ride out to Hayansa and back before... Uh, on the fourth day, essentially taking the train, the high-speed train, all the way through Seoul to Incheon Airport. So a quick word about the high-speed train, the KTX, in, uh, in Korea. It is clean, it's fast, and it's inexpensive. Um, from Incheon Airport to Busan, or uh, we actually went from Busan to Incheon Airport, it was about three and a half hours really really nice pretty good uh, Wi-Fi connection too from Seoul to Busan the two largest cities in South Korea it was a little over two and a half hours and it gives you a really different look at the countryside and what you're seeing here is a, a space just outside of a small city um, where you can see large high-rises and uh, arable land is at a premium in South Korea about 70 percent of South Korea is mountains and so you can't really sprawl across all the land that would have then been your agricultural land so on the edge of cities you see these large sets of high-rises and that's where people are moving to um, it's a really interesting thing you could be in a city take a drive out in just a few minutes just be out in the country where it's only farmland and uh, it's sort of the old way of life it's really intriguing so on our the sort of day zero in Busan we took that high-speed train and arrived you know late so that it wasn't really possible to see anything that day it was raining um, so we took a walk found a Japanese uh, Korean style which was really kind of fun so um, you know, I'm, I'm used to being able to order sushi and, you know, English or Japanese. That didn't work really great in this situation. They did have a picture menu for us. And the term that I had for a Korean chirashi bowl um, brought us out this, which is really interesting. It's like a tonkatsu that has then been simmered in, uh, you know, sort of Korean style in uh, a soup that's really clean with lots of chilies in it. And then there was egg broken over it. Really fantastic. Would have never known to order it. Really happy we got got it. And then, you know, with the time that we had, we went to a place called Bujon Market, um, which was right next to our hotel, and just walked around, and it's block after block of enclosed market. So I'm just going to show you a few of the sights. I'm sorry that you can't have the sounds or the smells. They were really intriguing. These are stingrays, or some type of ray, over on the left, along with abalone, fresh abalone, and you can get it so tender in uh, in Korea, it's not even funny. And this place doesn't smell like fish. It's so fresh, it just doesn't have that fishy smell. Yeah, you'd have to figure it'd be a place with uh, that many chili peppers, with how many chili peppers we were getting in our food. Uh, you also had to be ready for motorcycles to go right through. And this is kind of a, you know, three, four shoulders wide would bring the place to a halt. You still had to know if a motorcycle was coming up behind you. And all these little side dishes, you'd wonder, you know, how does a family do three or four side dishes? Well, of course, there would be local delis um, where you could go through and get your different banchan. Um, and uh, here you can see they're specializing in the hot. Anytime you see this much red, it's gonna be hot. So on our first full day in Busan, uh, it turned out it was just raining, 
It was raining really hard that morning, but just one city back up in Daegu. In Daegu, it was it wasn't raining, um, and so we decided, yeah, it was worth getting on the uh, the KTX again and heading back up and checking out the Daegu National Museum, um, which is a really nice state of the art building. Um, couldn't find much information online that was in English. Uh, saw a picture much like the one that you're looking at here and thought, well, it might be an all-day thing. Turned out it was kind of half a day thing, and it's a nice little collection. Um, after you've been to the National Museum in Seoul, it's not a massive collection, but it is really good for some of the smaller types of artifacts, and what they had that other places didn't have are really fine collections of Buddhist reliquaries from the Shilla dynasty, and that's what you're looking at here, including those tiny little pagoda, which are about uh, maybe three inches tall each. They look like chess pieces, but they're actually little stupas, little, pagoda, little pagodas. And uh, from there, um, we headed up back to uh, back to Busan and uh, up to a spot called Bimoza Temple. Um, and Bimoza is actually we we got on a uh, a uh, subway line and rode it from essentially as far south as you can go, almost in Busan, to almost the end of the line north. So we uh, hit a, a mountain that was kind of outside of town, and though the rain had cleared, a mist had formed on the mountain, and it was really just kind of the the perfect way uh, to check out Bamosa Temple. Uh, really atmospheric. I mean, you you can imagine how sequestered one would feel uh, up on this mountain far away from cities, sort of in the old days before the city grew right up to the mountain. Um, and then uh, one thing that I had known to look for because of Dr. Peterson was Sanshin, and uh, that's the uh, sort of uh, in the local shaman religion, uh, that is uh, the mountain god, and I knew that I would find him somewhere. He's not Buddhist, but he gets incorporated into Buddhist temples in Korea. And behind one of the last buildings all the way up the hill, there's the little tiny temple that has him, and this is the rock face that's going to have uh, inscriptions in front of it. So that's what his temple looks like inside, and then these are the, the little rock sculptures and uh, a, a small inscription to him. Um, Korean culture, right there in the middle of the first uh, world religion, a very pan-Asian religion. And we decided we would uh, keep walking up the hill. It was a nice day. Um, that mist was really, really clean, sort of cleared things out. And we got to our first hermitage, and it was dedicated to a group of monks who had actually protected this place. And it's one of the reasons why the buildings are so old compared to some of the other Buddhist uh, buildings is they hadn't been burned. And so you can see the fighting monks commemorated above. And then behind the hermitage was a fantastic three-dimensional mandala. And behind that, um, a really giant uh, uh, Kuan Yin, or Kuan Um in, in Korean, and uh, a very, very large Maitreya. We had no idea those were going to be there, and just looming out of the mist, these things were quite impressive. And it encouraged us to go on to the next hermitage, which is called the, the, it's called the Crow's Nest Hermitage. And uh, so you see these steps to the left here. Um, you went up about a kilometer of steps, a kilometer uh, and a third or so maybe of steps, not quite a mile, but pretty much straight up uh, the mountainside and uh, we didn't get a giant uh, mandala there but there was this really very peaceful uh, looking quantum uh, uh, altar on the right and what would have been a spectacular view I'm sure that's why they call it the crow's nest but all we could see was mist so on the second day we took to chartered car which was a much uh, easier way for us to get to Gyeongju the capital city for uh, of the ancient Korean empires. And uh, this is a, a heritage city. And as a heritage city, um, it has really different sites, and you can see those sites from a car in a way that you wouldn't have from a train, maybe from a bus. Um, this is just a gas station. But take a look at the way that not just the gas station itself, but the, the awning that covers the gas pumps have to have a traditional roof on them. I thought that was really kind of intriguing. Uh, you know, that's uh, it, it gave the place um, both a very authentic and a slightly Disneyland feel in that particular way. Um, on the bottom is just a random set of tombs that we happen to be driving by. Um, one interesting thing uh, about Korea, it's been so incredibly stable that not all of its tombs have been robbed. In fact, most have not, the big royal ones. And so there are, uh, you know, dozens of these tumuli 
all over the place and each one of them has all kinds of interesting buried treasures in it archaeological uh treasures that is um but it's not necessarily a great idea in a country with such confucian roots to dig up one's ancestors and so um i'm thinking that most of these are going to remain untapped untouched uh, gianju has a place of prominence like sort of uh, uh nothing we have here in the u.s it being the the place where uh Korea was originally unified, um, there is a big push to make sure that all school children in South Korea spend three days in Gyeongju stu uh, you know, studying the, uh, their shared ancient past. It's a really kind of wonderful thing. So from my earlier trip th up there, we're on a weekend this time, but the earlier trip up there, you can see in the uppermost picture that there are kids going back and forth. And uh, yeah, they were all headed up to see the same thing we're going to see, which is the Siokurum uh, Grottoes. And um, it's uh, kind of an amazing thing, I think. Um, the same way kids got out to the, these national museums, they were encouraged and brought uh, to these ancient spots. They were encouraged to, to learn their, their past, their, their shared uh, legacy. Um, the Siokurum Grottoes, uh, once you've climbed around the sort of top of this mountain or an old hermitage, um, and this is them up there. You can see there's this sort of man-made looking mountaintop, and that is indeed a man-made cave inside um, a, a man-made corbel dome. Um, and this is a spot that had been lost to history for a while. In 1909, it was uh, rediscovered by a Japanese postman uh, who was uh, trying to hide from the rain, and it looked like what you see on the left. Um, and then they tried to rebuild it with uh, concrete, the Japanese, during the occupation period, and that caused things to mold, so it was reworked, uh, restored to uh, the original sort of, of construction, which allowed for more ventilation. And then this front was added that you can see here. That's actually the, the domed area back there. Um, today, with, without making special uh, arrangements, you can't get in unless you are getting in to pray. Um, it's all glassed in in there and no pictures are allowed. Not sure uh, quite why no pictures um, since there's no paint. Um, but uh, there was a, a, a major tragedy when the number one treasure the of South Korea, the South Gate in Seoul, had burned just a few years in the past. And so a number of these sites now have very, very strong uh, protections on them. Um, these aren't my pictures because you can't take pictures in there. Um, but for anybody who's been in my Asian art classes, you'll recognize this immediately as being probably the far, the the most far east example of rock cut Buddhist caves along the Silk Route. And you can see the guardian kings on the sides here. Um, there are uh, Bodhisattva on the inside as well as some of the Brahmanic gods. And then uh, we've got a, a Bearing Earth to Witness Buddha. And you can see that from your view walking in, you are meant to see this aureole right behind him. Um, it's a very, very uh, powerful piece, and I hope that one day I'm able to go in and take a look. This is the view from right in front of that place. You would be looking out, and it almost like you could, on a clear day, see Japan from this spot, this last big city spot on the Silk Route. Um, and this is an a, the sea that would be known for us as the Sea of Japan. But one thing that I learned that was really important is that uh, uh, Koreans don't particularly like the name the Sea of Japan. Uh, they prefer the East Sea, which is a much more neutral designation. And uh, I think I'm going to start including that in my lessons as well. The other really big spot on the day was the Bulguksa Temple. Um, and this is just a, a really kind of amazing place. The stone foundation down here is Shilla Dynasty. Um, but it's been burned a couple of times. So the top portion in wood is Joseon Dynasty. And there's the Goryeo period in between. So um, this is actually, we're talking about uh, about a, a thousand year difference almost between the building of the two. But it's still known as a place where there's this incredible harmony between stone and wood. And I just want to point out, um, you know, a lot of things are very symbolic in Buddhism. Notice that in order to enter through the, the actual old front gates, one would go over a bridge 
but there's no water there and there hasn't been. It's symbolic that one is passing from one type of space into the next. Here's that harmony in stone. These are all stone, even though that looks like wood there, and, uh, and wood above. Really very beautiful. It's also a place on the right where you can still see very active Buddhism, and you can see some of the oldest in-situ bronze sculptures in Korea. Um, the real art history treasure in this place are two very, very early stone pagodas, uh, both Shilla period, um, pretty darn amazing. Uh, you can see that the one on the right is built in a way where it is still mimicking older, per uh, probably less permanent, more uh, perishable designs made from wood. Uh, and the one on the left is actually uh, the pagoda where the oldest book in Korea and maybe the oldest book uh, known uh, was found in. Uh, really pretty amazing. Lunch in Gyeongju was just absolutely fantastic. So we sat down at a place where, and this was pretty normal uh, in Korea, where they, there was a heater in the middle of the table, um, and they brought out a platter of vegetables, uh, raw shrimp, you can see that on the front side at the top, uh, raw octopus on the back, and yam noodles, and then a lot of hot chili paste. And then you, you cooked this at your table, and it was really one of the best meals that we had. Absolutely fantastic. Um, we went to the Gyeongju National Museum. I don't want to give you too many museum highlights, but I'm going to give you two kind of interesting ones because you never know what you're looking for or what you're going to find, right? So um, the this is uh, in the upper left is a sixth or seventh century um, end cap. It's a roof tile um, from a structure that's long since destroyed, and it was kind of joked that this is the Mona Lisa of Korea. It's just a, a face. No one knows the context, but she's got this sort of smile and looks away, so you see it on a lot of uh, posters, t-shirts, and whatnot. Um, in the upper right is a game that resembles Go, and it would be from the same time period. Pretty crazy. And then you can go to Tumuli Park, and we did, um, where the largest of the Shilla uh, tumuli are. Um, three have been excavated. This is one that has been restored in such a way that you can go in. You, there would have never been an entrance like this, however. That's just for modern people to go in and be able to see how there was a wooden structure below, and then rocks were stacked around it, and then it was covered with earth. Um, these would have all just been covered with earth. And like I said, lots and lots of these magnificent tombs they have not been robbed. So that night we had a really interesting meal planned um, and we knew of a place that specialized in eel. Um, the night before we tried to go to a place that was specializing in octopus that uh, we found out was closed and this time we went to the place with eel and it was open but there was no one in the building. I mean the cash register was like right there and there was just no one in the building. And so we stood around for a while and then we were really disappointed and I didn't want to go back without finding what we were looking for so we kind of wandered around and in a couple blocks we found a place that uh, served eel you can see them in the tanks live in the upper left and uh, as we were trying to figure out whether to go into the place or not uh, a guy who was fishing the eels out kind of held the bucket uh, open for us that he was fishing them into to show us to say you want to come in. And uh, yeah, we wanted to come in. And uh, so we didn't even know what to do. Um, all we had were the words for pretty much uh, hello, thank you. Um, and we had the Romanized spelling for uh, grilled eel, which they did come out with after that's all we could really say. And um, we didn't know how to do it. And so uh, one of the women from the back sat down with us. She thought it was pretty funny. We thought it was pretty funny. She showed us how to grill these things uh, and then dip them into a chili paste and then grill them a second time, which you see on the right with chilies. It was really hot. It was fantastic. And that eel was so fresh. It wasn't alive, but it was so fresh that it actually moved on the grill, which was a little unnerving and really delicious. On our third full and final day in uh, Busan, we actually weren't really in Busan, we had to take the longest car ride that we've had on the trip, about three hours drive to Hansa Temple.
and we were going to handsaw temple um, for uh, another portion which I'll get to uh, in just a second but I want to say it's a really beautiful temple in and of itself it had to be rebuilt in the 1800s because it had been burned it actually burned in the 1600s as well um, but it's a great atmosphere and it does house uh, on the right two uh, Vairochana Buddhas that are uh, the two oldest known wooden sculptures in uh, Korea they might not look uh, wooden they're uh, they're gilt with bronze but what we were going to see is the uh, Ganjiang Panjan which is this building above the temple and it is uh, the home of the uh, Tripitaka Koreana which is a 13th century set of wood blocks and when I say set of wood blocks I mean 81,000 that's right 81,000 wood blocks which comprise the oldest existing Buddhist canon um, and each block has two pages on the front and two pages on the back so just multiply that by four and that's how many pages of this 13th century that's 1200s uh, printed book there is um, this building itself is actually a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site and um, you can see these aren't my pictures uh, visitors aren't allowed in any longer without special accommodations um, but this is actually open in certain ways to uh, the air larger events on the bottom smaller on the top and for some reason um, and scientists haven't figured it out but the monks who built this place knew it it's not really susceptible to fire the other church or the other temple has built has burnt um, a couple of times if not three um, since this was built in the 15th century um, but bugs avoid it it doesn't mold uh, it is just a, a, a really, really kind of wonderful and freakish thing. And so it's kind of a miracle that these 81,000 woodblocks exist in this place. So both the woodblocks themselves are a World Heritage Site, and then a second designation is given for the building. Today, if you want to get a really good view, but you haven't made those accommodations, this is about the best you can do uh, through the grading. Um, but you can see those wood blocks are in there and I did buy a couple of prints uh, made from those wood blocks they um, I just couldn't resist not as a printmaker and as somebody who uh, who is an academic uh, it was just uh, too much not to buy and it was about five dollars US and then this is the last meal that we had out in the field before returning to the hotel and starting to pack up to return the next day and this is monks food but it's a monk's feast. It's not what a monk would eat every day. And um, I mean, maybe they knew that we were Westerners coming because there's also um, small dried sardines over here. And then there's an egg and cold beef dish over there. Um, but most of these are root vegetables or fungi that you find in the woods and on hills, and uh, including the these sort of woody uh, roots that are in this uh, Korean pancake, uh, along with the thing that I called everyday soup, the miso uh, and uh, and bean paste soup, and it was just a, f a fantastic way to finish things off. Beautiful flavors, all different textures, just um, fantastic. So I could not uh, recommend Korea more. Um, you don't really need to speak Korean. It probably helps if you try a little, and if you know it, it's even better. Um, but just a really friendly and fascinating place. Great art, great people, great food.